How many millionaires do you know who have become wealthy by investing in savings accounts? I rest my case. So most people out there are looking to earn some type of return for their money. And we all know that savings accounts are just not a great way to build your wealth. And that is because interest rates are at all time lows. And when you account for things like inflation or the increase of prices over time, you actually end up losing money when you simply put it into a savings account. So when it comes to investing, there are primarily two different strategies that people follow in order to build their wealth. Number one is investing in the stock market and number two is investing in real estate. Now, both of these avenues have their own pros and cons, but specifically in this video today, we're gonna cover everything you need to know to get started with investing in the stock market. Now, there's nothing wrong with either one of these investments. In fact, in most cases, it makes sense to invest in both real estate and the stock market, which is what I have done myself and other people have as well. But the main problem with investing in real estate is that if you're looking to go out there and purchase a rental property or a home, it's going to oftentimes cost you tens of thousands of dollars, making this a high barrier to entry investment. The good thing about the stock market is it is now easier than ever before to get started and you can literally begin investing in the stock market with $100 or less. And I'm gonna show you step by step how to do this in this video today. Now that being said guys, before we jump into things here, I just have to make a disclaimer that I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice and you should always do your own research and due diligence before making any investment decisions. Also guys, I'm anticipating this will be a much longer video than usual, so if you want to skip ahead to different sections in the video, check the description down below and I'll have timestamps covering the different sections in this video. But that being said guys, let's jump right into it and cover the first thing you need to know about investing in the stock market. All right, so the first thing we have to cover here is what exactly is the stock market? Before you go out there and invest in stocks or anything out there, you should understand what exactly it is that you're investing in and what is the stock market. So the stock market is just like any other market out there, which essentially means it's a place where people buy and sell things. So the example I like to use is thinking about a flea market. This is where people who have different items all come together and you can buy things and you can sell things all in one place. So the stock market is very simply a place where people come together to buy and sell stocks. But what exactly is a stock? Well, a stock is an underlying ownership stake of a real company and specifically it is of a publicly traded company. So not all companies out there are public. There are some very large privately owned companies which means that the general public is unable to buy shares of these companies. Then you have public companies which have gone through an IPO or initial public offering, which means average people like you and me, the general public can actually purchase shares and own a small piece of this company. So keep that in mind when you're looking at stocks to purchase, even if you're just buying a couple of shares, you're buying a piece of a real company and a real business. Now, once a company goes from being a private company to a public company, they are held to stricter standards. They're required to, on a quarterly basis, share earnings statements and other statements with shareholders as a means of letting investors know how that company is doing. So a lot of companies out there don't want to be so transparent about their earnings and things like that. So as a result, they remain private companies. However, oftentimes when companies go public, this is a means for early investors and management to actually be able to make money from that investment because they have this IPO 
and then shares trade publicly and they're able to sell a portion of their shares to make money from their ownership stake in this company. Now, unlike the supermarket like Walmart and things like that, the stock market does have set hours when it's open and this is when you're able to basically buy and sell shares of stocks. And the hours for the stock market are 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. It's closed on holidays and that is when you are able to transact and buy and sell stocks in the stock market. Now, some brokerages, which we'll explain in a little bit, do allow you to trade stocks before the market opens and after it closes. But for the most part, most people are participating in the stock market during normal market hours of 9.30 to 4 p.m. Now, one thing that's interesting about the stock market is as soon as the stock market opens, the price for an underlying stock or fund starts changing every couple of seconds. And this is referred to as the quote for that particular stock, which is essentially what people are willing to pay for it and what people are willing to buy it for. And this is one of the most interesting parts about the stock market is that price changes all of the time based on varying market conditions. It's kind of weird because when you think about real estate or antiques, things like that, the price of that isn't changing all the time. It's different than real estate, for example, because when you buy a piece of property, you pay a certain price for it, and then that's basically what it's worth you don't necessarily have the given value of that property being updated every couple of seconds. But you do have that with the stock market where that quotation price is constantly changing. And this is simply based on the current supply and demand for that stock. So when there's a demand for a stock and the demand exceeds the supply, meaning more people are trying to buy it than sell it, that price goes higher and higher. And when there's a supply of that stock hitting the market, when more people are trying to sell it, less people are trying to buy it, that price goes lower. The best analogy I have for this is thinking about purchasing gas. We know there's been times when you go to the pump and you buy a gallon of gas for two or three dollars and it seems relatively inexpensive. That's because there's plenty of gas out there and not that many people are trying to buy it. Then there's been other times in the past when gas prices are four or five dollars a gallon, which is pretty expensive. And that is because there's more demand for this gas than supply. And as a result, that price climbs higher and higher. That same exact principle here of supply and demand is what controls the stock market. And that supply and demand of a given stock is based on what is going on with that company, what's going on with that industry or the market as a whole. So let's say for example, Tesla came out and they said that they had new battery technology that was better than ever before. And all of a sudden a bunch of people say, wow, I wanna buy some Tesla stock. The demand for that is likely going to be higher and there's not gonna be as many people looking to sell shares of Tesla in the stock market. So as a result, that price climbs higher and higher. And at those higher price levels, people who own shares may then decide, okay, I'll part with a couple of shares, that way I can make some money. On the other hand, let's say that there's bad news that comes out about a company. Maybe Tesla comes out and they say, hey, our battery technology you know, is not as far ahead as we thought it would be right now. And a bunch of Tesla investors say, you know what, I don't wanna own this anymore, I'm gonna sell it. At that point, there's more people trying to sell shares and get rid of them than there are people trying to buy them. So the price goes lower and lower as people are willing to take less and less money for those shares. But at a certain point, that price gets low enough and new investors are like, you know what? That's a price I'm willing to pay. I'll buy some shares of Tesla. And this supply and demand is what controls prices in any given market out there, just like the stock market. And then another huge factor to understand about the stock market is beyond just the individual company news or whatever is going on in that industry, major events in the world can affect the stock market as a whole. So for example, when the global pandemic took over and businesses were closing and unemployment was going up, the stock market in general was seeing a lot of supply. People were concerned about owning stocks. They wanted to sell them and move their money into cash. 
and more people were selling shares of everything out there than they were purchasing. So as a result, the entire market went down because there was more supply and less demand. So you're going to see the prices of stocks that you own change based on what's going on with that individual company, based on what's going on in that industry, as well as what's going on with the overall market and what is going on in the world. So in summary here for this section, guys, just understand that a stock is an underlying ownership stake in a real company. And at the end of the day, the price that you're paying for any given stock out there is based on the current supply and demand, which could be based on something to do with the company itself or the overall market or industry. Okay, so the second thing you have to understand about investing in the stock market is the difference between investing in individual stocks and then investing in funds. So we already covered this in the first section, but a stock is essentially an ownership stake in a real company. And a lot of people go out there and they purchase individual stocks with the goal of outperforming the overall market or getting a better rate of return than what they could get by passively investing in funds. But what exactly is a fund? Let's cover that right now. So a fund is simply a basket of different stocks all lumped in together that you're able to invest in through one investment. Now in the past, a lot of people would buy something called a mutual fund, which is something that is actively managed. So you have your money being managed by somebody else and you're paying fees to them and they take that fee to conduct research and decide what to invest your money into. However, over the last couple of years, a lot of people have realized that these actively managed mutual funds are oftentimes not the best investment due to the fact that the fees are significantly higher and oftentimes they are unable to beat the average market returns. So essentially, in many cases with mutual funds, you're paying fees for somebody to try to beat the market and then they're unable to do that. So what has become a more popular investment in recent years is something called an index fund where essentially you passively own a number of different companies that track an underlying market index. Now, when we're referring to beating the market or talking about average market returns, what we are referring to here is the average return from something called the S&P 500, which is a market index. And a market index is simply something that people use as a tool for a benchmark of how the overall market is doing as a whole. And the S&P 500 is simply 500 of the largest publicly traded US companies. So these mutual fund managers would try to beat the return of the S&P 500. And people who go out there and buy individual stocks are oftentimes attempting to beat the average market return. However, if we look at statistics and data, we know that most people are unsuccessful when it comes to beating the average market return. So instead, people will purchase index funds where they can passively own an index like the S&P 500 in a very low cost and low fee manner. Because rather than paying somebody to pick these stocks for you, you just own the entire market and when the whole market does well, you do well. And since there's not much active management involved in that process, the fees associated with that investment are significantly lower. So you generally have two different types of investors out there. You have those who are active investors who want to pick and choose individual stocks or individual funds with the goal of beating the average market return. Then you have the second type of investor who wants to just passively own the market. They don't wanna pick stocks. They don't wanna worry about any of that research. They simply want to own the market and not try to beat the market. And of course, you can follow a blend of both strategies where you may have some individual stocks that you decide that you want to own, but you also have a portion of your money passively invested in these low fee index funds. Now, as far as buying these index funds, you can pretty much do them in two different ways. 
Number one, you can buy them directly from the fund company. For example, Vanguard, they offer a lot of different index funds. You can go on the Vanguard website and invest directly in these funds through Vanguard's website. Or the second option, which is often easier, is to invest in these index funds through something called an ETF or exchange traded fund. This may sound complicated, guys, but it's very simple. It is simply a way to buy individual shares of this index fund, just like a stock, rather than investing directly through the fund company. And this does carry a couple of advantages. Uh, oftentimes you have higher liquidity, it's easier to buy and sell, and you should check this with different fund companies, but in most cases, the fees associated with investing through their fund website versus the ETF are oftentimes the same. All right, guys, so in summary here for this section, most people out there either follow the strategy of picking individual stocks with the goal of beating the market, or they passively invest in low fee index funds as a means to own the market and generate reasonable returns. In the past, mutual funds were a lot more popular, but many people have realized that because of the high management fees and low success rate, they're kind of a lousy investment. All right, so now that we understand what exactly a stock is and what a fund is, the next question to answer here is how do you actually buy and sell stocks or funds? Well, we know that you're doing this by participating in the stock market, but it's not as simple as just going out there and calling up the stock market and saying, hey, let me buy some shares of Tesla or something like that. In order to buy shares of a stock or fund, you have to do this through a brokerage, which essentially is going to place these orders on your behalf. Now, the good news is in recent years, it's become easier than ever before to participate in the stock market. And that is based on lower fees and zero commissions, as well as lower account minimums. So in the past, in order to participate in the stock market, you used to have to pay high commissions per trade of anywhere from seven to $10. Every time you place a trade, you were paying that commission to your brokerage. And many of these companies had high minimums of $500 or $1,000 or more. Well, now there's a lot of commission-free alternatives with no minimum balances, and I'm going to discuss a few of those here shortly. But essentially, my best example to make a comparison here is buying stocks is just like going out there and buying a new truck. Let's say, for example, you wanted to buy a Ford F-150. You wouldn't call Ford up and say, hey, let me buy a truck. You would instead go to a car dealership, a Ford dealership, and purchase your truck through them. A stock brokerage is simply like a dealer for stocks. You call them up, or in this case, you go on your phone and place your order, and they fill those orders for you, utilizing the stock market where people are buying and selling shares. Now, the good news for you is that the brokerage industry is very competitive, and a lot of these up and coming brokerages are offering sign up incentives to basically incentivize you to utilize them to buy and sell stocks on your behalf. So I wanna cover now a couple of brokerages that are good for beginners. And full transparency here, guys, I am affiliated with these brokerages. So if you use my links down in the description, I may earn a small commission in the process. No pressure to use those guys, but it is a great way to give back to me for putting this video together and a way to support my channel at no additional cost to you. So the first platform I wanna mention here is called Webull. They offer commission-free stock trading with $0 minimums, and they also offer retirement accounts for free with no minimums, which is not something you typically see available from different brokerages. We talked about that sign-up incentive earlier. Uh, what they do for you is if you open up an account with them and you fund it with $100 or more, you're going to get a completely free stock worth anywhere from $8 up to $1,600 based on a lottery system. Now, Webull is a little bit more advanced with a lot of research tools and data. So if you are a complete beginner, it might be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, so if you're looking for a slightly simpler version, 
My second pick here is Robin Hood, which is also 100% commission free with no minimums. They're just a lot more basic and beginner friendly. The only thing you might run into with Robin Hood is after you get started and you get your feet wet, you might find it's a bit lacking in terms of research tools and other features out there. Robinhood is by far the most beginner friendly app out there for buying shares of stocks and funds. And they also have a sign up incentive where if you open up an account with them and you can fund it with any amount of money, you're going to get one free stock worth anywhere from $2.50 up to $200. And of course, guys, if you want to get two completely free stocks, you could sign up for Webull and sign up for Robinhood. Take both of those for a test drive and see which platform you like better. And then third and finally is the main brokerage I use, which is M1 Finance. Unfortunately, they don't offer any type of sign up incentive, but if you want to support me by using that link, that is totally up to you. M1 Finance has a lot of great features for long term investing, such as dividend reinvestment, they offer free pre built portfolios, and they offer fractional shares where you don't have to buy entire shares of stocks in order to invest. Um, it's a great platform overall for more long term investing, but if you're looking to trade individual stocks, in and out on a regular basis, that's not the best platform to choose because they only offer two trading windows per day. Now, as far as actually buying and selling stocks or funds on these brokerages, I'm not going to get into detail there because it's gonna be slightly different based on what brokerage that you choose. But what I would recommend is once you open up your brokerage account, whichever one you choose, whether it be on my list or a different list out there, simply go to YouTube and type in the search bar how to buy stocks on blank and fill in the brokerage that you're using. And there's a lot of helpful videos out there that will walk you through step by step how to buy stocks on these different platforms. So anyways, guys, in summary here for this section, in order to buy and sell stocks, you have to do so through a brokerage, which is essentially going to place these trades on your behalf. It's gotten a lot more competitive over the last couple of years, which is good for us because fees have been reduced to basically zero. Um, minimums are oftentimes zero dollars as well. And a lot of these companies offer free stocks or promotions as a sign up incentive to basically get you to invest with them. So now we're going to talk about how you actually make money in the stock market. And for some people, this may be a no brainer, but I've had a lot of people ask me this question in the past of, understanding that you can go out there and you buy shares of these companies or you buy into these funds, but how do you actually make money? And there's two different ways that you can make money when you invest in the stock market. Number one is through asset appreciation, which is essentially where the underlying asset, stock or fund that you buy goes up in value over time. And then number two is dividends, which is essentially cash payments from these underlying investments. And we're gonna go ahead and explain both of these right now. Now, when we're talking about asset appreciation versus dividend income, we're actually talking about two different investing styles. One of these is investing for growth and the other is investing for income. And there is such thing as a blend of both of these where you have stocks or funds that have growth potential or the potential to increase in value as well as income potential from the dividends paid by these stocks. Also guys, real quick favor here, if you've been enjoying this video so far, please go ahead and drop a like for the YouTube algorithm and make sure you subscribe and hit that bell for future notifications of new uploads. So first of all, let's talk about income investing or making money through dividends. Dividends are essentially cash payments that a company shares with investors as a means of sharing their profit. So there's different stages that companies go through. You have the early stages of growth when they may not be profitable, but they're increasing revenue at a very fast rate. That is referred to as a growth stock. But then you have these larger, more well-established companies that may not be growing as fast as new companies. However, they are way more profitable, way more 
consistent and they may not have as much growth potential, but they do make consistent profits and they share a portion of those profits with investors in the form of dividends. Now, most dividend stocks out there are going to pay dividends on a quarterly basis. However, there are some that pay monthly dividends. There's also some biannual and annual dividends. And so that is something to be aware of if you are entering the realm of dividend investing. And it's important to understand as well here that companies are not required to pay dividends. For example, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's holdings company there, has never paid dividends because Warren Buffett believes that he's able to earn better returns for investors by reinvesting those profits himself. However, for a lot of these well-established companies like Coca-Cola or 3M, and these large companies that don't have a ton of growth potential, paying these consistent quarterly dividends is a way to keep investors around, giving them a means to earn a return on their investment. So when you own a dividend paying stock, if it's a quarterly dividend, there's a set amount of money you're going to receive every single quarter based on how many shares that you own. So if, for example, a stock paid a five cent quarterly dividend and you had four shares of that stock, well, every quarter you would earn 20 cents in dividends from that particular stock. And the way that most people keep track of how much they're earning from dividends is something called the dividend yield. And that is simply the percentage you're earning back based on the price you're paying per share. So for example, if you paid $100 for a given stock and you were able to earn $5 per year in dividends from that stock based on the current price and the current dividend payment, well, that stock would have a dividend yield of 5%. And while we're talking about dividend yields here, typically this is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 2% to 5%. Uh, so you're not oftentimes going to find safe dividend investments out there with yields of eight or 10 or 12%. You may see this sometimes with stocks out there. However, it's oftentimes a bad sign and dividends are never guaranteed. Companies can cut or eliminate them at any point in time. So just understand that a safe dividend is typically around two to five percent if you're looking at stocks with double digit dividends that is almost always a red flag and something you're going to want to avoid so that is the income side of investing or making money through dividends now let's talk about the growth side or making money from asset appreciation the most basic example i can give you here comes back to real estate, which is where many people have seen this type of asset appreciation. So let's say for example, you buy a house for $200,000 and then 10 years later, you go to sell that house and you sell it for $250,000. Well, in that 10 years that you owned that property, that asset appreciated in value by $50,000. Well, the same exact thing can happen with stocks and funds that you own, and it all comes back to the basics of supply and demand that we talked about in the beginning of this video. For example, in 2020, we have seen a lot of demand for Tesla stock and Amazon stock. And because there is so much demand for these shares, the asset has appreciated in value because the share price went from being lower to now being much higher. On the other side of the coin, however, we've seen the exact opposite take place with some companies that are falling out of favor. Based on the global pandemic that we saw here, the demand fell sharply for stocks like Macy's and American Airlines as many investors were selling these stocks. So when you have a lot of people buying into a stock or an industry, that share price climbs higher and higher, and that's how you make money through that asset appreciation. Maybe you buy a stock at 50 and you sell it for 60. You have $10 of capital gains, and that is the asset appreciation. On the other hand, 
Stocks can also go down in value where maybe you bought a share of an airline stock at $40 per share and based on the overwhelming supply of new shares hitting the market, now it's down to $20 per share, so you've lost $20 per share that you own. Now the important thing to understand here is that in order to actually make money from asset appreciation or the growth of a stock or fund, you actually have to sell it. You can't make money just from that going higher. You have to sell that stock to somebody else and lock in that capital gain. So essentially, let's say for example, you had a stock you bought at $30 per share, and now it's at $40 per share. You have made $10 per share on paper, but in order to actually lock in that gain, you would have to sell that stock to somebody else at a price of $40 per share. And whatever the difference is between what you paid and what you sold it for is your capital gain or capital loss on that investment. However, the exciting thing about income investing is that you don't have to sell that investment in order to make money from it because just by simply owning dividend stocks or funds that pay dividends, you're able to earn that quarterly or monthly dividend or whatever the frequency is just because you own that stock. So you're actually rewarded by owning that stock for the long run and you don't have to sell it in order to make money. Now, as far as dividend investing goes, the strategy that most people follow, especially when they are young, is reinvesting those quarterly dividends back into the issuing stock. So let's say for example, you owned a bunch of Coca-Cola stock and they paid out their quarterly dividend. And let's say you made $50 in dividends. Well, rather than taking 50 bucks and going out and buying dinner or going to the movies, you can take that $50 and put it back into Coca-Cola shares, which will allow you to earn more dividends in the future. And this is a phenomenon referred to as compound interest, which is where a lot of the gains from the stock market come from. You don't take your money and run, you reinvest that money back into that stock, and you rinse and you repeat this quarter after quarter, year after year, and this is where you are able to build large and serious massive amounts of wealth for yourself by doing this for a very long period of time. So back to the S&P 500, or essentially this benchmark we use to track the overall stock market, when we're talking about the overall average return from the stock market, we're looking at collectively these 500 companies, how much they go up in value collectively all together or the asset appreciation, as well as how much these companies collectively pay in dividends. And when you combine these two together, that gives you your annualized return from the S&P 500. And based on the S&P 500, looking at the last 100 years of data or so, we know this is an average return of around eight to 10% per year, which is a realistic expectation to have when investing in the stock market for the long run. Now in the short term, year to year, you're not typically going to see an eight to 10% return. You might see one year where it goes up 15% and then another year where it goes down 5% or 10% and that is because there are bull markets and there are bear markets or periods of time when stocks are going up or stocks are going down. But when you invest for the long run and you look at many years of data, that is the average typical return that you see from the stock market. So for example, we saw our most recent stock market crash or bear market earlier this year in 2020, which was immediately followed by a bull market where the market went up for a period of time. And you have to be comfortable in understanding of these hills and valleys within the market, but understand that over the long run, looking at a long span of time, the stock market tends to go up in value as a way to generate returns. If you just simply leave your money in your savings account, you're going to lose money every single year. The stock market is by no means a guaranteed way to make money, but when you look at it over the long run, it does generate wealth for investors and it has made a lot of people rich in the process. So anyways guys, in summary here for this section, you make money in the stock market either from dividends or income or asset appreciation or growth 
of the underlying share price. There are some companies out there that are just fully in growth mode where they don't pay any dividends because they're not profitable. Then there's companies that don't really have a lot of growth potential, but they pay high dividends because they are very profitable. Then you have companies in the middle that offer a blend of growth potential and income potential. We know that returns on average in the stock market, looking at the S&P 500, are around eight to 10% per year, but you can't expect to see that every single year because the market doesn't just go up in a straight line. And when you're looking at investing in the stock market, most people, including myself, would agree that money is made by investing in the long run, not so much in the short term when the market is unpredictable. So before we get into some different stocks and funds that are beginner friendly, the last thing I wanna cover here is the importance of something called diversification, or very simply, not putting all of your eggs in one basket. So most people out there achieve diversification by investing in stocks, as well as bonds and real estate and maybe potentially other things out there like cryptocurrency, precious metals, antiques, and different uncommon assets like that. And the idea here is you don't want to have all of your money in any one given asset because as we have talked about already, the stock market has times when it's going up and times when it's going down. And you don't want all of your money in one asset because when it goes down, your entire portfolio goes down. So let's say maybe you have some money in stocks and you have some money in real estate and you have some money in bonds. Maybe the stock market is going down, but the real estate market is pretty steady and maybe the bond market is going up as a result. You wanna have your money doing different things at different times and this is achieved through diversification. So you can diversify across different assets like we just discussed, but within the stock market, you also wanna make sure you're diversified across different stocks and different industries. So it would not be wise to go out there and put all of your money into Tesla stock or Amazon stock or any one given stock because if something happens with that company, you're not well diversified and you're going to potentially take a big hit. So a general rule of thumb that I like to follow is never put more than 20% of your money in any one thing, whether that be a particular stock or in cryptocurrency. I like to personally have my money spread out across all kinds of different assets. That way I'm in different markets and I'm not gonna be heavily affected if one market does poorly. And the same philosophy with the stock market, I would never put more than 20% of my money into one given stock. Now, when you're first getting started with the stock market, you probably don't have a ton of money to invest with. And so diversification is not as important early on. But I would say once you start investing a couple thousand dollars, maybe $5,000 or more, that's when you wanna think about spreading your money out across different stocks or different industries. That way you don't have all of your eggs in one basket. Now within the stock market, there's a couple of different ways that people achieve diversification. Number one is different sectors and industries or essentially investing in different areas of the economy. Maybe you have some money in tech, but you also have some money in financials and you have some money in industrials. You're putting your money in different segments of the economy. And so the idea here is if there is some kind of uh, economic event that affects a certain industry, it's not going to drag down the entire market as a whole. Um, maybe, you know, tech gets hit pretty hard, but industrials is doing pretty good during that time. So spreading your money out across different business segments is one way that people diversify. Second of all is diversifying across different locations. So not only investing in just the US market, but investing in global markets as well. Third of all is investing in different company sizes. So you're not just investing in small companies, you're also in medium and large companies as well. And then finally, like we said earlier, investing in different assets is another way where maybe you have 80% of your money in stocks and 20% in bonds. Maybe you have some money in real estate as well. For now, if you're brand new to this and you're just playing around with a couple hundred dollars, don't stress out too much about diversification. But once you have a couple thousand dollars invested, keep this in the back of your mind and think about how you can spread your money out. That way you don't have all of your money in one place. 
All right, guys, so the last thing I want to cover in this section here are a couple of beginner-friendly stocks and funds that you may want to do your own research on. Now, again, I already stated this in the beginning, guys, but I am not a financial advisor. I'm not telling you to go out there and buy these stocks. These are not recommendations to buy. I'm simply pointing you in the right direction, and I'm gonna share with you a couple of stocks that I own in my investment portfolio. Now, I am a firm believer in the fact that you should invest in companies that you know and that you understand. Most of the best investments I have made are based on me buying stocks of companies that I actually use the product and I like the product. For example, I'm a big fan of Apple products. That is a stock in my portfolio, and that is a stock I have done very well on, and it's because of the fact that I love Apple products, so do a lot of other people out there. So you don't have to make it super complicated. In fact, you shouldn't. I would instead look at what things that you like in your world and in your life, and what are your favorite companies, and think about whether or not you would want to invest in them. However, that being said, if you're looking for some ideas, not recommendations, here are a couple for you. First of all, Coca-Cola, that is a stock in my dividend portfolio. Warren Buffett is a big investor in this company. They're probably the world's most recognizable brand. They're time-tested, they are on the lower side of risk because of how long they've been around, and they are a consistent dividend payer. Coca-Cola, you really can't go wrong with this stock as a beginner in terms of just getting your feet wet and owning something that's not going to massively fluctuate in value because this is a very durable, time-tested investment. If you're looking for more of a growth play, Amazon may be one to consider based on this current trend shifting towards e-commerce we've been seeing over the last couple of years, which has been accelerated by this global pandemic. I have owned Amazon numerous times in the past. I've done very well with this stock. They're not a dividend payer because they're still in growth mode, but I think they are poised to benefit based on this ongoing trend we are seeing with the growth of e-commerce. After that on my list here is Apple, and this to me is a good blend of both growth and income because they are a dividend payer, they pay a small dividend. However, there's also still a lot of growth potential with this company based on the fact that they are expanding into new technologies and they're on the cutting edge with their devices. So Apple is a stock where you can earn some dividend income while having the growth potential. That is why Apple is a large component of my own investment portfolio. Next up we have Procter & Gamble. They make a lot of different household products that you probably used this morning without even knowing it. They have been paying dividends for 130 years and they've been growing their dividends year after year consecutively for 64 years. If you're looking to get into dividend investing, you really cannot go wrong with a stock like Procter & Gamble. And the last stock on my list here, which you really can't go wrong with as a beginner, is Disney. Now, they have been hit hard recently because of the closure of their theme parks, but I still think it's a solid pick overall. Uh, and this is one of those weird companies that doesn't pay a quarterly dividend. They actually pay dividends two times per year. But in terms of a safer and less volatile or stock that moves up and down investment, Coca-Cola, Disney, you know, you, you really aren't going to get much better than that as a complete beginner. Because when you're brand new to investing, you don't wanna be taking risks. You don't wanna buy something where the price changes all the time. It's gonna stress you out. Start with something simple that's easy to understand and maybe even a product that you know and love, like in my case, investing in Apple. And then as far as index funds go, I have three examples here you may want to do some research on. First of all, probably the most popular one is VOO. That is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, which is one of the most inexpensive ways to own the S&P 500. So when you buy VOO, you own a small piece of 500 of the largest publicly traded companies in the US. So you have the potential for growth from those companies as well as the income through dividends. So collectively, whatever dividends are earned from those companies in that group that pay dividends, those dividends are paid out on a quarterly basis from this fund. 
And as far as fees go, the expense ratio for this fund is just 0.03%, which is pretty much as good as it gets. You may find some that are lower out there, but we're talking about a very minuscule fee. Another fund here is SCHV. That is the Schwab US Large Cap Value ETF, where you own a diversified collection of large US companies with reasonable valuations. So you're investing in the big giants, the titans of the United States. And this is a, another one that has a lower expense ratio of just 0.04%. And then lastly, we have QQQ. That is Invesco QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100. This is a tech heavy fund that mostly invests in big technology names like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google. So this is pretty much a diversified investment focused on tech. So a lot of young people like tech, they want to be investing in that. This is a way to do it in a diversified manner. However, the expense ratio is a little bit higher at 0.2%. So anyways, guys, that's gonna wrap up this video. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you made it to the very end, leave me a comment down below. I'm always curious how many people watch the entire video when I do these type of marathon videos. Uh, if you feel like supporting the channel for putting this video together, feel free to check out those links down in the description below and grab a couple of free stocks. I also have a great article over on my blog, Investing Simple, which would be a good complement to this, which is a step-by-step -step guide on investing in the stock market for beginners. I'll put a link to that down below as well. But thanks so much for watching, guys. Make sure you drop a like, subscribe, and hit that bell, and I hope to see you in the next video.